Well, welcome everybody. Can I just say, if you're giving me a gift, don't give me a cat or a hammer. <laughs> How many of y'all have a tradition in your, in your family, maybe, where y'all exchange gifts? Anybody where, you know, when your family's small enough, everybody gets everybody a gift, but then as your family either gets bigger or you get broker, you can't buy everybody a present, you know what I'm saying? So you may draw names and then you swap gifts or whatever. I can remember as a kid, we would go to my cousins, you know, to my grandparents and swap gifts with our cousins. And you would see a gift under the tree with your name on it, and you tried to figure out what it was. Did y'all do that? Pick it up, shake it, feel how heavy it is, feel you know, kind of the shape of it, or whatever it is. And you would try to guess what was in the box. And if necessary, you might bribe your cousin to tell you what was in the box. And you couldn't find out until the adults said it was time. Didn't that get on y'all's nerves? Come on, anybody? Get on your nerves, because the adults wouldn't let us open the gifts until it was time. Now, this only happened whenever you were at your grandparents' house, because if you were at your house and there were gifts under the tree, all you did was when your parents weren't there, you unwrapped them, saw what you got, and then wrapped it back up. Come on, anybody cheat like that? Y'all know you did, right? But it happens. You, you have a gift. It's got your name on it, but it's a mystery. you got some idea, but it's a mystery as to what exactly is in the box. We're going to be talking about that over the next couple of weeks from the book of Isaiah. If you have a Bible, go ahead and find the Old Testament book of Isaiah. We're going to be in chapter 7 today. Isaiah lived somewhere between the year, uh, let's say 740, or he ministered somewhere between 740 B.C. and 680 B.C., so about 700 years before Jesus. And he was pro prophesying to the nation of uh, Israel, and he was basically warning them, saying, hey, listen, if you guys don't turn from your wicked ways and turn back to God, it's going to be trouble. But in the midst of that warning, there was this message of hope that God was sending a gift. God was sending a deliverer, a Messiah, we would say. He was sending a Christ child, and yet though he was saying this idea that God's sending this gift, it was kind of shrouded in the prophetic words. It was kind of, kind of muddled a little bit amidst the prophecies of the day and, and the current situation. So people would read Isaiah's words. They would ponder Isaiah's words. They would maybe shake and, 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 and converse about Isaiah's words, but nobody could really figure out exactly what this deliverer, this Messiah, this Christ child was going to be like until 700 years later, God finally said, it's time. And through the gift of life, his son being born of a virgin, God let us unwrap his gift to us, Jesus, the son of God given to us. So, so here's what we're going to do. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some prophecies from Isaiah, some some uh, suggestions about what the gift was, though it was veiled and wrapped. And we're going to unpack it then through the lens of the New Testament to see exactly what it is that God's given us this Christmas season. Now, here's where we're going to start today. Today, we're going to start with this idea that Jesus is God's gift to you, but what Jesus really is, is he's the gift of hope. He's the gift of hope. Even if your world right now is unraveling, and some of you are at home and you're not physically at church because your world is unraveling and, and you don't know what else to do. All right? If your world is unraveling, Jesus is your hope. Now, when I say hope, I don't mean wishful thinking. Y'all know what I'm saying? You know, I hope something happens. You don't really think it is, but you hope something happens. I hope I win the new lottery in Mississippi, right? I, I, I hope that, that somehow, you know, I'm not going to gain any weight over the holidays. I, I hope that my, my boyfriend will go uh, shopping with me instead of going to duck camp. Uh, that ain't going to happen, okay? You're not going to win the lottery. You're going to get fatter probably over the next few weeks, and your boyfriend's probably going to duck camp, okay? So I'm not talking about wishful thinking. No, when the Bible talks about hope, what the Bible talks about is a confident expectation for your future based in God. So when I'm talking about having hope, that's what I'm saying, that, that you can have today a confident expectation for the future based in God. Now, a lot of people need hope today, a confident expectation of the future, even when your world is unraveling, because our world sometimes seems to unravel. The, the life that you were enjoying, the life or the relationship that you thought you had, things that were rolling along, all of a sudden something happens, a curveball is thrown, an event happens, a crisis is precipitated, and all of a sudden that's not your reality anymore, and you don't know which way is up, you don't know what to believe, who to trust and everything seems to be unraveling on you, and it's like you can't get your arms around it, and you're losing hope today. I've been thinking about just some people around me, some folks that I've bumped into, that, that their life in some ways is, is coming undone. 
father of an adult child who is running from God and he just feels so helpless to turn her heart. I'm thinking about a friend who's being crushed right now through the weight of infidelity. He thought he had one relationship and turns out it was nothing like that. I'm thinking about an email that I read earlier this week from a family that our elders had prayed for and they were at a specialist, the specialist in America. And yet the specialist, the one who knows more than anybody else says, I'm sorry, there's nothing else that we can do. Where do you turn? When, when the best has done everything they can do. Maybe you know somebody whose world is unraveling. They've lost their job. They've lost their investment fortune, right? They've lost their money. Maybe they've lost both. And now their world seems to be reeling all around them. Is there hope for a person? Can a person really have hope, a confident expectation for the future when life seems to be unraveling? I want to suggest to you today that you can have hope and that that hope is found by trusting in God, that there's a correlation between your trusting God and your confident expectation for your future. And so God is inviting you today in the midst of whatever you have going on to find hope by trusting him and not your own way. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell two stories today. We're going to kind of walk through them in the scripture. One story you're going to know very, very well, maybe too well. And then the other story you may not know at all. And so we're going to start with the one you don't know at all. But the hope is, as I tell you these two stories about two guys whose worlds are unraveling and they have very different responses to God, that somehow you would begin to see yourself and that you would begin to come to God in trust and find hope. Fair enough? The first one's found in Isaiah 7. It's where we are today. It's a story about a guy named Ahaz whose world was unraveling and he chose not to trust God. Ahaz is uh, a king of, of Judah in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are lots of kings over Israel, the, the United Kingdom, and then whenever it divides, kings over Israel, the northern part, and Judah, the southern part. If you read the books of Kings and Chronicles, it tells all about them. Some kings were good and godly. Other kings were bad and ungodly. Ahaz is bad and ungodly. He doesn't worship God. He goes after the ways of the world, and it's partially because of that he finds his world unraveling. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1 reads like this. Now, it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, he's the king of Judah, that Reason, the king of Aram, a different nation, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, a different nation, they went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but they couldn't conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, that's Ahaz, saying the Arameans have camped in Ephraim, which is just right outside the door of Jerusalem, the capital city, his heart, Ahaz's heart, and the hearts of the people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Now, a couple of things you, you probably noticed. First of all, you have a guy named Ahaz who's not necessarily a good and godly king, but he's got two guys coming against him. Two kings, the king of Aram and the king of Israel, have allied together, and they are waging war against him, about to attack Jerusalem, the capital city. Now, if you read Kings and Chronicles, which also tell a little bit about his story, you find that these guys have already devastated most of his kingdom. The only thing left is Jerusalem, and so he's been basically wiped out. And you also read, quite naturally, that he is scared to death, right? His heart, the hearts of all the people, are shaken like leaves. Y'all ever wonder where that comes from? We're shaken like a leaf? There you go. Their hearts... And the, uh, and the heart of the king was shaking. He was scared to death, which is quite naturally when your world is falling apart. It's a common emotion. You don't know how you're going to make it. Your mind kicks into overdrive and you start to speculate and imagine the worst case scenario, right? You never, you never get bad news and goes, oh my gosh, it's going to be so good. This is going to happen. This gonna... No, when you get bad news, it's always worst case scenario. Your mind drifts to the worst possible case. And that's what's happening. Everybody is freaking out. That's what fear does. Fear robs you of faith and fear robs you of hope. Okay? So he's freaking out. But it also says that God was sending a word to the house of David. Now, we read that and that didn't mean anything to you, but let me tell you how Ahaz would have heard that. Ahaz would have heard that this way. God made David a promise that he would always have somebody on the throne ruling his people. That was a covenant promise from God. So when Isaiah says to Ahaz, speak to the house of David, tell Ahaz you're inheriting that covenant, what he's saying to Ahaz is, bro, this ain't really about you right now. 
This is about the faithfulness of God. Your life is about the faithfulness of God to God's promise. You have not been faithful to God, but God will always be faithful to himself. So God then gives a word specifically to Ahaz. That's verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Jashub. Now if you don't have anything else to be thankful for this Thanksgiving, just thank God your mama didn't name you that. Right? Thank God that's not your name. But that was Isaiah's son's name. And here's where Ahaz is going to be. He's going to be at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field and say to him, take care and be calm and have no fear. Don't be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of reason and Aram and the son of Remaliah. In other words, God's talking smack. These boys ain't nothing to me. They may be freaking you out, but God says to Ahaz, I am not freaked out one little bit. God knows exactly where Ahaz is and where he will be. He sends Isaiah and his son to the exact point. Ahaz didn't have to drop a pen and send it to him. God knew. God knew exactly what he was going through. God knew exactly what he was up against. He knew exactly what he was feeling. God knows. Here's what I want you to hear, is that God knows exactly what you're going through right now. God sees, God hears, God's aware. Psalm 139, look it up later. Psalm 139 says that God is before you and he's behind you. God is all around you. God knows when you lie down and when you get up. God knows when you leave and when you come back home. God knows your words before you say them. God knows your thoughts before you think them. David was blown away. The psalmist was blown away. He said, it's too wonderful for me. And yet that's the way God is with you right now. You may not know it, feel it, or understand it, but God sees you. Could you receive that right now? Whatever's going on with your, in your world, could you right now just say, God, you see me. What's going on is not a mystery to you. You see me. God speaks a word through Isaiah. He says, here's what I want you to tell him. I want you to tell him to take care, be calm, have no fear, and don't be faint-hearted. Let me translate that. He says, I know you're freaking out right now, but in your freak out, have faith. Take care. That means to be on guard, specifically to make sure you guard the fact that you're in covenant. Stay in the covenant. God's promises stand in the promises. Don't uh, be calm. Have a quietness and an undisturbed inner peace about you. Have no fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Don't be afraid of your future. These guys are smoldering firebrands. These guys are going to be put out. You've got God on your side. Don't be faint-hearted, weak, or tender, or timid in your inner person. No, you be strong. You be bold. You be confident. You have hope. That's unusual, but it is the offering of God for you to have this kind of peace. When I was in college and God was reordering my private world and um, really transforming my life one moment and day at a time, I read a book called Ordering Your Private World by a guy named Gordon McDonald. Part of what he said in that book, he came to this, this chapter and he talked about having an inner peace. Having an inner peace. And he told, told a story about uh, this captain of a submarine who was not in the control room. He had gone to his room and was trying to rest, when all of a sudden the submarine started making these violent maneuvers. And so he knew that it was not normal. He, he was awakened, went to, the, went to the bridge, went to the place where the control room was. And though there was a lot of chaos going on, a lot of, a lot of uh, turning and stuff like that, when he walked into the control room, everybody was calm. The, captain, the, 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 the person in charge was calling out the orders and, and making, making the necessary adjustments. And the captain says, hey, is everything okay? And the person who was calling the shot said yes. There's a storm above us. There, is other, uh, there are other ships above us. And so we're just taking evasive maneuvers. And what he said was, though craziness was going on around him, there was calm in the control room. And he said, in your life, there may be craziness going all around you. A lot of storms, a lot of traffic. But you need to find a place, a deep, spiritually centered place in your life where you can say, I'm good. That's what God is offering Ahaz. That's what God is offering you right now in the middle of the freak out. He is saying to you, don't be fearful. Remember that God is a covenant-keeping, faithful God. 
God's not, God's not minimizing the reality and the grim nature of his circumstances. If you read on in verses 5 and 6, they tell us that God knows that the city is under siege, that the people are trying to terrorize them, that these enemies are trying to breach the wall and overthrow them. Ahaz and the people of Jerusalem are in a bad place. That's the, that's the real word, but God just has a better word. Look at verse 7. Isaiah 7, 7 says this. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand nor shall it come to pass. Now, if you have your Bible open, I want you to underline that in your Bible. Underline verse 7. It shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. God's not denying what you're going through. He just says, I have a better word. It may be over your head and out of your hands, but it's still under my feet. It shall not come to pass. It will not stand. God is trying to reassure him, and he's trying to reassure you that no matter what's going on, God's still in control. When you get down to verse 9, he says this, if you will not believe, you will surely not last. And I want you to underline that part of verse 9 too, because you can't underline verse 7 and claim doubt without believing verse 9. He says, it's a play on words in the Hebrew text, if you will not believe, you surely shall not last. The word believe and last are actually the same Hebrew word, amen. In other words, if you don't amen God and say, God, you're trustworthy, you're sure, you're my, you're my, you're my stable one, I'm relying on you. If you won't amen God, God says, you're not go- God's not going to amen you. You'll never experience stability and peace and that establishment in your life. But here's the, 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 the converse of that. If you will, amen God, God will then amen you. Now that's a promise in the scripture, that if you will trust God, God can establish you. It says says that in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. You amen God, God will establish or amen you. Even in the New Testament, it reads a little different, but here's the way it, it sounds. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, It's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Not just to believe in him, but believe that he is and that God is faithful. And I say, I'm amening God. And God says, okay, I can amen that back. I can bless that. I know you believe in God today. I'm not asking you to believe in God. Look, the demons believe and tremble. Can we agree with that? James 2.19, you can look it up. I'm not asking you if you believe in God. That's awesome. What God is saying is in the midst of the chaos, will you just trust him? Will you amen him? And say, God, I'm going to believe you and your way. The call to Ahaz was to believe. God's offering him hope in the darkness. More than hope, he's he's offering him a guarantee. I'm going to make things work out right. Now, here's the deal. God knows Ahaz, right? I told you he's not a good man. He's not a godly man. And so God knows that Ahaz is going to struggle with this belief. And so he sends Isaiah back to him a second time and says, hey, ask me for a sign, any sign. Ahaz acts like he's being real spiritual, saying, I know you're not supposed to ask God for a sign. And he didn't know that. That is in the Bible. But whenever God's telling you, hey, ask me for a sign because I'm telling you this is coming to pass, it wouldn't have been sinful. But he pretended to be more religious than he really was. And he said, I'm not going to ask God for a sign. And so God says, well, I'm going to give you one anyway. This is verse 13. Isaiah 7 verse 13 says that, Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you're also going to try try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Here it is. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Right? You probably heard this this prophecy, these verses before. The virgin's going to give birth to a son. You're going to name him Emmanuel. Verse 16 says... For before the boy, this promised child, will be old enough, will know enough to refuse evil and to choose good, which was typically for a Hebrew child, that that age of being bar mitzvah, coming under the law, was age 13. So within 13 years, the land whose two kings you dread, they're going to be wiped out. They're going to be forsaken. Now this prophecy of the virgin birth, I'm just being real with you, it's really hard to understand. It has an immediate and an ultimate fulfillment. The immediate fulfillment is really, in Isaiah's day, it's really hard to know, okay, who is the virgin that's going to give birth? And did somebody really name their child Emmanuel? And so people, scholars, speculate as to who that possibly could be. Okay, some people say, well, the virgin was probably Isaiah's second wife. His first wife passes away. He gets married again, has another child, and maybe that's what it is. Other people say, no, well, you know, the the virgin could be just any woman in, in Judah 
that, that the point is that, that somebody who's not pregnant yet is going to get pregnant, and by the time that child turns 13, the enemies are going to be overrun. Some people say, well, maybe it was somebody in Ahaz's house, maybe one of the princesses. Some people say maybe it was Ahaz's wife that would soon be named, and that the child that was born was ultimately a guy, a, a young boy named Hezekiah. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the word, the name Hezekiah, but he's going to follow Ahaz, and where Ahaz is a bad king, Hezekiah is a great king. A godly man leads a revival. The whole nation experiences God with us. I don't know. I'm just being real with you. I don't know. I don't know who it was in the immediate context who has the baby. But what I do know is that God said, before 13 years is up, both of these nations are going to be smoked. Isaiah's prophesying somewhere around the year 734 B.C. In 732 B.C., the Assyrians wipe out the Arameans. And in 722 B.C., Israel is also overrun by the Assyrians. God's word came to pass. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, but I'm asking you, would you just file that away, that, okay, God's word came to pass. Back 700 years before Jesus was ever born, God's saying stuff. God's making stuff happen. We sang a minute ago, right? Joy to the world. And sometimes we can sing those songs and you don't think about what you're saying. But do you remember when you sang this? He rules the world with grace and truth. Now think about that. He rules the world. God rules the world with grace and truth. And he makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. Let me change the whole song now, doesn't it? You're not just singing about a little baby. You're talking about God in control of everything. God was calling on Ahaz to believe like that. But Ahaz couldn't really do it. He really struggled to believe. Instead of trusting God and waiting to see God's faithfulness and protection, he decides to take matters into his own hands. Same temptation you're facing right now. When, when the fur starts flying and stuff starts hitting the fan, what's the first thing you do? You start taking things into your own hand, calling people and doing things and, and, and exercising your influence rather than waiting on God. I'm the same. I was thinking about several years ago when we lived in Brookhaven and I got a call that was a bad call. I had a crisis and so I hung up the phone. It was just me and Christy and I said, man, I got to call T-Bird. I got to call Mr. Fleet. I got to call Mr. Richard. And my wife said to me, well, you might just need to call God. How many of y'all have a Holy Spirit living in, with y'all in your house? Anybody got the Holy Spirit living with y'all? Come on. She was right. Look, when, when things got tough, I, I, my leadership gift kicks in right? My, my confronter, my challenger kicks in. I'm, I'm about to handle this. But whenever I handle it, you know what that means? It means I'm not letting God handle it. And there's some of you, that's what you're doing. Things are unraveling and you're calling people, making things happen, taking charge. But as long as you're doing that, you'll never experience God taking over. And so Ahaz scrapes all the money he can get together, hires the most powerful ally he can find, the Assyrians. 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 8 says this, Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house, and he sent a present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria listened to him, and the king of Assyria actually went up against Damascus, that's the Arameans, and he captured them and carried the people of it away into exile to Kerr, and he put reason to death. It seemed to work. Ahaz took over, and man, he took care of business for a little while. But ultimately, the one he turned to, the king of Assyria, turned on him and became an even bigger problem than the Arameans. That's the way it is. You can refuse to trust God. You can turn to other things or other ways, but ultimately, those other things can become an even bigger problem to you. I was talking with a guy who's an addiction specialist once about how alcohol can be an answer, a solution to some people's problems. Their world's unraveling, they don't know what to do, and so they just decide to get drunk. And you know what? For a little while, their problems are gone. They don't think about it, they don't worry about it, it's, it's not in their mind, life is good, but in the morning, the problem's still there. So you know what they have to do? Tomorrow, they got to get drunk again. And it works. The problem's gone, they don't feel the weight, they don't feel the anxiety, but when they wake up tomorrow, guess what? They haven't solved the problem. They just kicked the problem down the road. Now, let's suppose they just 
keep getting drunk day after day for six months. What happens? The solution now can become a problem. As a matter of fact, a bigger problem, harder problem than if you'd have just dealt with the situation in the first place. Does that, does that resonate with you? You understand what that means? How that is? It doesn't, maybe it's not alcohol, maybe it's overworking, maybe it's other relationships, maybe it's just your own self, your own wisdom, whatever it is. Whatever you turn to ultimately can end up ruling you. Ahaz turns to the Assyrians, and then the Assyrians turn on Ahaz. 2 Chronicles 28, 19 says, For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had brought about a lack of restraint in Judah and was very unfaithful to the Lord. So Tilgath-Pilneser, king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. Although Ahaz took a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the palace of the king and out of the princes and gave it to the king of Assyria, it did not help him. Now if you have an interest in reading more about it, just keep reading in Isaiah 7 where Isaiah says to Ahaz, because you're not turning to God, the Assyrians are not just going to be a thorn in your side, they're going to overthrow your nation and take your throne. Ahaz didn't trust God, and it cost him. He died and was buried, but not in the tombs with the kings. He was not worthy. Okay? What I want to say to you, and I think God's saying to you, is when your world is unraveling, if you turn away from God it is not going to end well for you. Okay? Now, that's the first story. Here's the second story, one that you probably do know. The story of a guy named Joseph in the New Testament in Matthew. His world, too, is unraveling, but he chooses to trust God. Remember, there was an immediate inter uh, fulfillment of the, of the prophecy, but there's also an ultimate uh, fulfillment as well. Matthew 1.18 says this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, they were engaged. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Now, y'all probably remember this story a little bit better, right? Joseph and Mary are engaged, but they've kept their relationship pure. They've not been sexually active. But one day, out of the blue, Mary shows up with the crushing news that she's pregnant. She tells Joseph some story about the Holy Spirit and about how God's the daddy and she's still a virgin, but somehow he's not buying it. That's ludicrous. That's crazy. He's born at night, but I wasn't born last night. Come on, would you believe it? If your teenage daughter was dating some guy in college and came home and said, Daddy, I'm pregnant, but it's not what you think. God is the Father. The Holy Spirit did this. I'm still a virgin. Would you, would you believe that? Come on, bruh. Right? What if it was your girlfriend or your fiance and you knew you hadn't been with her? Would you go, oh, makes perfect sense. Okay, so y'all get up off of Joseph a little bit, right? He's thinking, man, I'm not doing this. His mind is reeling and I'm sure he's just like us. He's working out all the worst case scenarios, right, in his mind. Who is it? What am I going to look like? What am I gonna, what's my family going to think? What are my friends going to say? Can I even deal with her? This, his world is crumbling. The life and the marriage that he expected weren't his reality anymore. So after mulling it over, Joseph, whom Matthew describes as a righteous man, he trusts God. That's, what right, that's how you know if you're righteous, whenever you amen God, when you believe God. Not believe in God. But when you believe God, you're a righteous person, the Bible says. And Joseph's a righteous man. He trusts God, but he decides that the best course of action for him is not to cause any more drama, not to put it to public shame, but he ain't going to stay married to her either. He's breaking the engagement. He's going to divorce her as quietly on the down low as he possibly can. He doesn't know how the future's going to work out, but he knows it ain't going to be with Mary. And I don't blame him. I, I could totally understand it. Maybe you can too. But in the middle of his saying, that's that. That night, while he's sleeping, in a dream, God sends an angel. Verse 20 of Matthew chapter 1. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, again, in line of the covenant, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She's going to bear a son. You're going to call his name Jesus. For he will save his people 
from their sins. It's interesting to me that the angel told Joseph exactly what Isaiah told Ahaz. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear rob you of faith and hope. I know you can't see this working out, and I know you already have your plan, but I want you, Joseph, to do something really hard. I want you to trust God and marry Mary anyway. The angel confirmed. Mary's telling the truth. The Holy Spirit is the father of this child. And in confirming this, God's telling Joseph that all those scenarios he played out in his head, those worst-case scenarios, they shall not pass. They shall not stand. If you believe, if you'll amen God, Joseph, God will amen you. You see, what God was saying to Joseph is that your life, Joseph, is bigger than you and Mary and even this moment. God's using you to write a story for the world. And I'm saying to you right now, you stand in a moment where God is saying to you, don't live in fear. God's inviting you in this moment, in the chaos, to amen him. He may be doing something bigger than you understand. Verse 22 says, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Do you see it? This is the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy. Now the story of Ahaz and the the story of Joseph are wed together through this prophecy. Two men, worlds crumbling, worlds unraveling, one ungodly, one godly, both with the same opportunity to trust God. And yet Joseph, by God's grace, chooses the better way. Not the easier way, but the better way. A righteous man believed God and trusted God, even when what God asked him to do was hard and seemed impossible. He chose to believe. He chose to say, God, you're up to something bigger than me. My job's not to have it all figured out. My job's not to know all the answers. My job is to put my trust and find hope, a confident expectation for the future in God, not myself. Have y'all ever wondered what would happen if Joseph would have stayed with his plan? Does anybody ever wonder that? Am I the only one? I mean, I guess preachers sit around and wonder about stuff like this all the time. But I wonder, man, what would have happened if Joseph wouldn't have done it? What if he'd have said, you know, God, I appreciate that. Hey, angel, wherever you are in my brain, my dream, I appreciate that. That's real awesome, but I ain't doing it. Look, I'm not hating on the guy. I'm saying I, I could understand how he could get there. It's just too much. I love you, God. I trust you. But I just don't think I can do What would have happened? I believe that God's plan would have kept going, do y'all? I believe Jesus, look, she's already pregnant. Jesus is already on the way. I believe Jesus is going to save the world no matter what. I believe that would have happened, but I don't know what would have happened. Would we have had manger manger scenes with no daddy? Mary been a single mom? I don't know. Did, Did God already have another guy picked out? If Joseph bugs out, now this is going to be her next. Some of y all know what that's like, right? Heard about this guy who was told his wife one day, hey, if I die, you think you'll get remarried? She said, probably. He said, well, do you think you'll like let him sleep in our bed? She said, maybe. He said, you think you'll let him play golf in my golf club? She said, oh, no, he's left-handed. <laughs> See, some of y'all got this thing. Y'all playing way too well right now. Y'all need to back on up a step, right? I don't know. I don't know if God had some other plan. My sense is he doesn't. My sense is He knows Joseph. He sees Joseph. He knows him to be a righteous man. He's seen Joseph prove himself faithful in other unseen things that you and I will never know about. And when he's looking for somebody to trust with a really heavy burden, he says, my man Joe can handle it. And so he gives this task and arranges their relationship so that Joseph is the chosen one. And Joseph chooses the harder path. I'm convinced the will of God would have gone on had Joseph chosen to bug out, Joseph would have missed out. But verse 24 says this, Joseph awoke from his sleep and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took Mary as his wife, but he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. You see, because Joseph trusted, Joseph had hope, a confident expectation for his future 
not just his future, but our future. And so I've told you the story of Ahaz, and I've told you, told you the story of Joseph, but now there's one, one more story that we've got to talk about, and that's your story. Who are you more like? Are you more like Ahaz, or are you going to be more like Joseph? Because the fact is, you're here, you're watching, you're listening, and your situation right now is impossible too. Not Ahaz's, not Joseph's exactly, but you feel just as hopeless. You're surrounded by difficulty. Your relationship expectations have just been dealt a death blow as far as you're concerned. Life has thrown you a major curveball and you swung and missed. You were not ready. You feel like your world is caving in. Your life situation seems beyond hope. But here's your sign. The virgin gave birth to a child. And we named him Emmanuel. God is with us. And God is inviting you right now in the midst of the chaos and the confusion and the craziness to find a deep, spiritually centered place where you amen God and find hope confident expectation for the future even in the crazy why is it that you should trust and how is it that you could find your hope in God today can I tell you why I think you ought to find hope in Jesus find hope in God based out of these stories it's because God's faithful as I contemplate, pray on, meditate on these stories, it occurs to me that God ought to be the one you turn to, not run from, because God is faithful. God, you can count on God. God's faithful. He's like the faithfulness of the sun coming up every morning. He's like the faithfulness of old faithful in Yellowstone. Every hour or so, she going to blow. Like faithful like your mother-in-law showing up at your house for the holidays, right? Whether you want her to or not, here she come. He's faithful. God is a Faithful God. He, you can amen God. What he says will come to pass. Did what he told Ahaz, did it come to pass? Oh, yes, it did. Those two kings and their nations destroyed in God's perfect time. Did what God said to Joseph come to pass? Come on now, I'm asking you not to hear a sermon. I'm asking you to receive this for your life. Was God faithful to what he told Joseph? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, he was faithful. Will God then be faithful to you? That's what I'm asking you to embrace today. That it may not look like you think, happen when you think it should, but God's faithfulness and timing are perfect. The Bible talks about the faithfulness of God in several ways, several things that God's faithful to do. He's faithful to you in the midst of the chaos to protect you. That's Psalm 91 verse 4. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. Whenever you're going through it, God is like a mother hen covering you. His faithfulness is like a shield. Ain't nothing going to happen to you, but has to come through God first. That's where you get that. God is faithful. He's faithful to guard you against the evil one. This is 2 Thessalonians 3.3. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. He is faithful to give you a way out of temptation if you're battling it. 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. And even if you blow it, God is faithful to forgive you if you confess, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful even when you're not. 2 Timothy 2, 13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. His presence and his promises are yours. It's a covenant. He is faithful every morning to give you new mercies. This is Lamentations 3.22. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And because God is the faithful one, your hope is secure. That's Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Claim God, you're faithful. I can amen you. I can count on you. I think you ought to put your trust and hope in God because God is with you. 
God is with you. That, that's Emmanuel. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. God is with us. He was with Ahaz. He saw and knew everything, and Ahaz was not left alone, even though he was an ungodly man. God still came to him and said, I got you if you'll trust me. God was with Joseph. He knew his heartache. He knew his struggle. He knew his pain. And yet God was with him and said, Joseph, I see you, but I got you. And God is with you. God sees you. He knows you. Whatever you're dealing with, he, he hears your cries of your heart, and he's going to move. It's a promise from God. There's a guy in the Old Testament, a different Joseph, that I love his story. His world crumbled like repeatedly. Hated and abused by his brother, brothers, falsely accused by a woman, thrown in jail as a rapist, forgotten in prison even though he did nothing but good to people. Over and over, this guy just had bad stuff happen. And yet the Bible in Genesis just repeatedly says this about Joseph. Genesis 39 verse 2 is one of the first times. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. Can I redefine success for you right quick? Success is not a pain-free, problem-free life. Success is a presence-filled life. You may have pain and problems, but you also have the presence of God. And that means you can have hope, a confident expectation for your future. Even if it feels hopeless, God says, I got you, I'm with you. Romans 15, 13 says, now, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you could abound with hope through the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. That God is with you. His Holy Spirit is with you. And if you will believe, you could abound with joy and peace and hope. Trust God because He's with you. He will not forsake you. And finally, you trust God because He will deliver you. It doesn't always look like you think. It doesn't always happen the way you thought it would or make sense. But Ahaz was delivered, at least for a time. And his enemies were crushed, just like God says, even in spite of his disobedience and disbelief. Joseph was vindicated, if not in his day, certainly in our day. He wasn't a fool. He got to be the father of the Savior for a season. And that Savior is the Savior of our world. Jesus saves his people from their sins. He came to live and to die and to pay your sin debt by his death on the cross. But then he was resurrected from the grave, ascended into heaven. He has rescued you from the, the control of the enemy. He has redeemed you and brought you back to God. That's what we learned in Colossians 1. He rescued us, us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You've got forgiveness, but please hear this. You've been introduced now to a new kingdom way of life where the king who is over you begins to live and rule in you and give you his peace. And then he begins to work his way out of you and he begins to bring deliverance to you day by day by day. But you've got to put your trust in him and his ways to experience this hope. Some years ago, I went hunting with a guy at the invitation of a friend. And so a pastor friend invites me to go hunting with his buddy who became my buddy. And so we're hunting uh, over on the river. And after we had hunted one evening, we're doing what guys do at the hunting camp, right? We ate too much. And then we're sitting around watching football and we're talking. And so I asked this dude, I said, hey, man, what's your story? And he said, well, I got a business and he's in the boating business and, and, and uh, tugboats and move stuff around and I uh, had a great business until 2008, but in 2008, there was a downturn in the economy, you may recall, and it just put a lot of people in a lot of pain, bankrupted a lot of people, ruined them. And my buddy was one of these guys, this guy I met, he's, he's one of them, that he said, man, it was devastating to my business. All through 2009, I just lived off of reserves and lived off of money I'd put aside, but by the time I got to 2010, I was done, I had nothing left. And he said that the banks began to call my notes. And these are people that I'd done a lot of business with, had been good to me, but all of a sudden it seemed like they were after me. And, and in hindsight, certainly they're not after them. They're, they're being true to their shareholders, right? They're doing what they have to do too, but they're calling his notes. And he's begging and he's pleading, saying, man, you're going to ruin me. You're going to ruin me. I'm losing everything. And they said, I'm so sorry, but your notes are coming due. And the bitterness began to eat at him. The hatred that he had for these people began to warp his thinking and ruined his peace. My preacher friend was telling him, bro, you've got to forgive these people. But he said, I ain't doing it. 
They're ruining me. They're ruining my life. Everything was coming unraveled. Finally, my preacher friend said to his buddy, he said, listen, if you don't forgive them, it's going to kill you. One Sunday in April of 2010, this guy was sitting in church listening to my friend preach when he sensed that God was saying to him, I know this is really hard for you, but I'm asking you to forgive them. Forgive these people that you think are out to ruin you. I'm asking you to let it go and trust me. And so sitting in church, just like you're sitting in church right now, he made a choice to be like Joseph. And amen, God. God, I don't know what this is going to be like. This is my world is caving in, but I'm choosing to trust you. I forgive him. After church, he called my buddy on the phone. He said, well, you won. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I, I had to forgive him today. God told me to forgive him, and I forgave him. He went to bed that night, and his world was still all jacked up, but he had a weird sense of peace that he had released it and a sense of contentment that God had him. Two days later, April the 20th, I think, 2010, you don't remember that day, but you'll remember this. There was an explosion on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig out in the Gulf of Mexico. Biggest oil spill in American history. British Petroleum called up my new buddy and said, we need every boat you have for the foreseeable future. And the initial contract is going to be $300 million. I can't even count that high. I said, bro, what did you do? He said, I paid off all my debts and I bought this camp we sitting at. You see, when you amen God, God can amen you. Now, am I saying that if my buddy wouldn't have forgiven him, that somehow the BP oil spill wouldn't have happened? No, probably still would have. But I'm just saying BP might not have called him. But when you put yourself in a place to say, God, this hurts me like crazy but I'm choosing to trust you even when I don't see you, even when it doesn't make sense. Nevertheless, I trust you. I'll amen you, and I believe that you're going to see me through. God has a way of showing up and birthing hope. Would you let him birth hope in you right now? Come on, all across the room, if you're watching on the live stream or listening on the podcast right now, can I just invite you to pray? Your world may be unraveling. Would you just tell God about it? He already knows, but let him hear it again. Just tell him, God, here's here's what I'm feeling. God, here's what I'm battling. God, here's where I'm at. But God, I don't want to be like Ahaz and try to handle it myself or turn to the world's ways. God, I want to be like Joseph, and I just want to amen you today. Doesn't mean you got it figured out. Doesn't mean you're even going to like what happens next. But God says, trust me. Amen me. This is what I want to ask you to pray. Just pray. Would you amen God this way? Would you say, God, I just say, amen. You're faithful. And I can count on you to protect me, to defend me against the evil one, to provide for me, to shield me, to forgive me, to give me mercy every morning. God, you are faithful. I receive that. I declare that. Would you amen God and just say, God, you're with me. I don't feel it. I don't sense it. But God, I received a covenant promise that whenever I received you into my life, you would never leave me nor forsake me. And so I just declare, in spite of what I feel or see, you have not let me go. You may feel lonely, but you're not alone. So God, I amen you. Would you tell God right now, God, I just say amen that you are my deliverer. I say amen to that. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where. I don't know who you're going to use in the process, but God, I declare you are my deliverer. You rule the world with truth and grace. And you make the nations prove the glories of your righteousness and the wonders of your love. So God, I say to you, I amen you. Deliver me from my sin, from my circumstances, 
from myself. And now would you just hear God, would you receive from God, would you say, God, I receive hope. A confident expectation for the future through Jesus. In just a second, I'm going to close this prayer time. We're going to stand up and just worship Jesus and tell him that he's good and he's with us. While we're doing that, there are going to be men and women around the room who'd love to pray with you online. There are folks that you could connect to. But I just don't want you to leave here with that same burden. I want you to find hope today. So when we stand to sing, would you just step out and come and take one of these folks by the hand and let them pray with you and encourage you and let hope rise. So Father, we love you. We bless you. We ask for your kingdom to come now. Your will be done in our hearts and lives, even as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 